Welcome to the 1048 Today, we're going to be thinking about learning. And uh, uh, we have a lot to say on this matter. Um, so, in some sense, uh, really all I'm getting up here to say is the word back propagation. I could just stand here and tell you just learn these models by back propagation, and we could all go home. But it might leave you kind of wondering exactly uh, how this all works out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next 80 minutes just thinking about uh, the implications of what it means to apply back propagation to the kinds of models that we've been thinking about. And what we'll find is that, uh, as usual, we're just going to be working with some gradients. And uh, we'll be working with familiar training algorithms or optimization algorithms like stochastic gradient descent. Um, and uh, things will work out elegantly uh, because of the conditional independence assumptions that we've made uh, inside our model. Okay, so uh, as well, uh, sort of the icing on the cake here is that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to also be able to talk about what it looks like to um, essentially use a neural network to come up with our potential functions. Uh, and doing so sort of falls out directly of thinking of uh, the actual graphical model and the likelihood that we compute for it as some admittedly kind of complex loss function. Okay, so uh, before we jump in, any questions? about where we are so far, where we're going. You guys have been actually asking great questions in office hours. One that came up was, how do we convert under, undirected graphical models to factor graphs again? Um, so there was this mistake in, in my slide. And uh, so here was the, here's, a, here's the corrected version. The, the broken version, showed that we should also, that I think I had an additional <coughs> factor like this in here. So um, to convert an undirected graphical model to a factor graph, we would say each maximal tweak in the undirected graphical model becomes a factor. And I had interjected this extra red factor, which now we're correctly removing. Um, and so here you can see that you know, we have one factor per maximal tweak in the original factor graph. Okay, so um, uh, also one additional clarification here. So homework two is out, and uh, the date on the PDF uh, was sort of stale. It hadn't, it hadn't actually been updated. So we released it on Saturday, and then the deadline is going to be two weeks from then. Uh, which is Saturday, October 12th. Okay. So we're going to begin our discussion in uh, talking about learning for Markov random fields. And this is essentially just to sort of paint the big picture. And then we'll kind of uh, dive down into specific details. So the idea is we have some data consisting of, uh, in this case, uh, for a Markov random field, there's just a bunch of variables that we're calling x. And so you have a bunch of samples from some unknown probability distribution, and that comprises your data set D. And to train the model, you maximize the likelihood, or sorry, you define your model as, uh, as usual um, as the product of the potential functions with a, normal, with a partition function to ensure it's normalized. And then your objective function is just the log probability of the actual data that you observed. And uh, so here, uh, I guess on this slide, this, this example is sort of silly, but we've been talking about part of speech tags, and I'm just using it as a running example here. So if we were building an MRF for this, uh, our training examples would consist of uh, tagged sentences. And so our variables x consist both of some w variables uh, that are words and some t variables that are tags. 
Okay, so why does this sort of feel like a silly uh, model to talk about? Does, does anyone have any notion of why this feels like a silly model to talk about? Markov random field in this way. Nothing really wrong with it. And in fact, it's kind of the globally normalized version of a hidden Markov model here. Uh, the thing that feels funny is that the CRF uh, is going to just basically accomplish the same thing, but it will do so in a much more flexible way. So we'll, we'll kind of review CRFs shortly to see that. Okay, so this is our model. And then um, our objective function is just going to be log likelihood, where we assign high probability to the things that we observe and low probability to everything else by tuning our parameters accordingly. And so learning is going to be tuning those parameters to maximize that objective. And the goals for today are to consider different parameterizations, so definitions of how we're using theta to get potential functions, and then uh, how to actually optimize this objective function. And inference tasks here are still really important because uh, we're generally going to need the partition function if we want to compute something like a probability out of this model. If our likelihood, our likelihood inherently requires the partition function to even compute it. And as well, we'll find that uh, all the gradients that we're working with are going to end up relying on uh, variable marginals and factor marginals. And uh, you, you can equate these in your mind to the, the normalized versions of the variable belief and factor belief that was the output of belief propagation. Okay. And um, if you wanted to, at the end, after you had trained this, depending on your loss function, map inference, which is just choosing the assignment that is most probable, may or may not be the, the best option for decoding. Okay, so this is the big picture. So what we can think about now is um, a few assumptions. So one is that the actual graphical model structure is given. So we're not going to assume that you are, say, learning the actual structure of the graphical model. So, uh, this notion of structure learning is sort of its own subfield. We could talk a lot about it. Uh, another important assumption is that every variable is going to appear in the training examples. We can also relax that assumption. Uh, doing so would give us hidden state models. Uh, and not surprisingly, we can marginalize over things that we don't observe and still do a lot of what we're talking about today. So we'll come back to that point later. But these are assumptions for today, just to keep things simple. And there's a couple questions that you should have in mind. So um, one is, you know, what does the likelihood objective actually accomplish? Another is, you know, is the likelihood objective actually the right one? Is it, is it really capturing what you care about? Uh, a third one is, how do we actually optimize the objective function, even if we did sort of agree that it was the right thing. And then another one that you should always have in mind is uh, what are the actual guarantees provided to you by your optimization algorithm? Uh, some uh, give better guarantees than others. And then uh, the last is, um, well, maybe this really should have been our first question which is, what is the mapping from your actual data to some model? Um, and the, the real question here is, you know, um, given some problem, how do we actually come up with an appropriate model, right? We assumed that uh, the graphical model structure is given, but we would hope that somehow you had domain knowledge about the actual task that you're working on that informed what the actual structure of the graphical model was. Okay. okay, so there's lots of questions to address. And as well, even if we're just thinking about Markov random fields, we're also going to talk about conditional random fields. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you could actually train. All of these also apply to conditional random fields. Um, but uh, 
We're not going to talk about every sort of possible way under the sun. There's a number of ways up here, like iterative proportional fitting and generative iterative scaling that people used to use when these things were sort of first invented and have since sort of been supplanted by gradient-based methods, like stochastic gradient descent and Adam, Adagrad, et cetera. Um, and so uh, the other thing to notice here is that what training method is appropriate might actually depend on how you parameterize your potential functions. So when we say, uh, when we talk about this notion of parameterization, what we mean is how are you actually defining uh, these potential functions, right? Is it defined as just something tabular, right? an actual table of parameters? Or is it defined as some log linear model like this one? Or maybe is it defined by some neural network? And depending on how you choose, you'll have different options in front of you. OK, so let's talk first about this trivial case, which is where we have tabular potential functions. I guess it's not tri trivial is maybe strong, but uh, the easiest case. And, um, and we're going to think about sort of a, a simple example where we can work through how we would come up with the maximum likelihood estimates for some simple models. So the first one that I want to think about is, so this is essentially a maximum likelihood estimation by inspection. And here, uh, what I mean by inspection is that, you know, we're actually going to like uh, look at what we come up with and determine retroactively whether or not it was correct. So this will be sort of a guess and check methodology here. Okay. So, um, Here's example one. Um, and this is going to be uh, just a linear chain on three variables. So we'll have uh, x1, x2, and x3. And this is some factor graph where they're connected accordingly in a chain. And so we have that the probability of x1 x2 and x3 is given by uh, psi 1, 2 of x1 and x2 times psi of 2, 3 of x2 and x3. Okay. So um, here, oh, actually, uh, why don't we just, before we get too far here, why don't we just get rid of uh, these x's and use some simpler letters here. Uh, this would just be annoying, hard to read. Let's say instead that we have uh, random variables A, B, and C. So we have probability of A, B, and C, psi of A, B, psi of B, C. Okay. That way you don't have to squint quite so hard to see the subscripts. OK, so same model as before, but easier notation. And uh, so now uh, what I want to say is we're going to have um, uh, sort of an important condition that we're aiming for. Um, so the condition is that the um, uh, it's true of the maximum likelihood estimates. So uh, we don't know what they are, but it's true of the maximum likelihood estimates for any model that uh, if we have uh, some random sub some arbitrary uh, subset of the random variables x alpha, then it holds that uh, the actual count of the number of times that the assignment x alpha appeared in our data divided by the total number of examples, um, uh, that is going to uh, be what we define as, so this is actually sort of a reverse definition de uh, of something here, uh, p tilde of xc. Okay, so this is sort of a general statement about any graphical model. 
And now what we're going to do is we're going to make our random, our sort of uh, our not so random guess as to what the maximum likelihood estimates could be here. Okay, and so our guess is going to be that P of A, B, and C might decompose as the pre uh, the P tilde of A and B times P tilde of B and C. And here's the important bit, where we divide out by P tilde of B. Okay. Now, um, it's important to note that uh, I've cheated. I already knew what the right answer was. So, uh, so this wasn't an entirely random guess. Um, but we're further going to say that uh, this first term is what we're calling psi of AB, and the second term is what we're calling psi of BC. Okay. So, um, so now uh, we have some notion of what our potential functions are, and here we can now check whether the condition actually holds. Oh, so let's see. So this is the number of samples in our training data set. And this is a uh, number of times x alpha is observed, also in that same data set. x alpha is supposed to be the same. The, the assignment, it's the assignment to some particular set of variables. So, sorry, so this, I guess I left out the, the crucial thing here, which is for all alpha and all x alpha, this has to hold for any maximum likelihood estimates. Yeah. When you divide by C and B, does that have like an effect on the normal distribution factor? Um, so here, uh, what I've essentially done is I've just said that, you know, I'm actually defining psi of AB to be this P tilde AB, which is like the empirical marginal. So we just count up the number of times that we observe that particular assignment to A and B in the data set. And then I'm assigning this to those values. So P of A, P of A times A times C is supposed to have like a minimum B as well, right? Right, right. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Sorry, I just missed that. Thank you. So this whole thing, we can divide by Z. Thanks. And you divide the, that also by Z? Oh, uh, so uh, we should check whether, we should check what the value of Z is at the end of this. Okay, so. Um, okay, was there one more question or? So, all right, so here, uh, now what we're going to do is verify that the conditions hold. And so to do that, uh, we can just say, okay, well, the first question is, what is, uh, we have that P of x1, x2 is by definition equal to a sum, oops, sorry, not x is here. A and B's, so P of A and B is equal to a sum over Z of P of A, B, C. Right? This just holds by definition. And then uh, here we could actually substitute in our notion of P of A, B, C. So we'll have that uh, we get P tilde of X1. Whoops. Mentally, I just can't make the leap. Uh -huh. I wrote down one thing and didn't do another. P of AB times P tilde of BC divided by P tilde of B. And uh, so now what we get is we, we can say that 
here if we uh, move the summation over C in, then what we get is P tilde of AB times a summation over C of P tilde of BC divided by P tilde of B. Okay. So what happens to uh, this summation? Yeah, it should just be 1, because it's really just the empirical estimate of uh, P of C given B, right? We can give that a tilde, too, to indicate that it's like an empirical estimate of that, right? Okay, so that means that this whole thing goes to 1, and we have that with equality, this is equal to the empirical marginal. Okay, so the first condition holds that the empirical marginal for AB is equal to, or sorry, the true marginal for AB is equal to the empirical marginal. So now we can actually go through the exact same steps for P of BC, but you should see that, you know, this is exactly symmetrical, right? If we did that whole thing exactly like we did here, uh, we would have all of these steps just repeated. Uh, but for the other half of the graph, and we would get back that P tilde of BC is equal to the true marginal P of BC. Okay. So, uh, so what we get here is then that um, uh, our P tilde uh, is, or sorry, I should be careful here. Uh, our, our definition of uh, these sides are equal to the maximum likelihood estimates. <coughs> so, um, uh, so I want to do one more example before we head back to the slides here, which is uh, a slightly, this will be example number two. We have a question. Oh, yeah, so, oh, sorry. So, yeah, sorry, I just forgot to go back to this. So, uh, I think Z should be 1 here. Um, I'm not 100% sure. We'd actually have to double check it. But uh, I think that uh, we should be able to actually verify it pretty quickly. So, uh, for... It's the sum of ABC over... It's the sum of ABC over these... Quantities and um, and so we're going to have counts of the number of times we saw AB times the number of times we saw BC <coughs> divided by the double counting that happens on B. Okay, so there's going to be so what you see going on in in our definition here of our choice of potential functions is that we're counting up the number of times that, so let's, let's actually write this out, this term out in terms of uh, uh, these count variables. So this is going to be n of AB times n of BC divided by n of B times n, right? Because there's actually Two, uh, two terms on the numerator that divide by n, and one on the denominator, uh, and so the so one of the n terms cancels out. Is it n squared or n of b? Uh, n of b. So it's the number of times that we observe that particular value of b. And so I think if we showed that we that we we should be able to show that summing over all values of a, b, and c. So if we sum over A, B, and C here, we should get uh, that this is equal to Z, which is 1. So um, 
this is like more of a combinatorial uh, problem, and I actually don't know uh, exactly the path from this little summation to one. Um, so I'll, I'll skip it for now, but uh, this is where it goes. Okay. So, okay, so example number two here is uh, if we instead said, let's consider a model where we have uh, random variables A, B, C, and D. And here, uh, let's actually think of this as now an undirected graphical model for convenience here. Um, so here, uh, what we're looking at, so this is a UGM. And what we can do is we can actually take um, that, uh, our, our sort of guess here would be that uh, P hat, sort of the, the actual empirical guess at what the joint probability will work out to be is going to be P of A, B, C, D uh, is equal to uh, P of A, B, C times P of B, C, D divided by P of B and C. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at this graph and we're, we're kind of breaking it up into three parts. So the, the first part uh, you could think of as sort of subgraph A and this uh, bottom part we could think of as subgraph B and then there's this part in the middle that we could think of as some separating set that uh, that is the overlap uh, between A and B. Okay. So, in fact, what we would find here is that, uh, so if we have a graph that's decomposable in that it can be recursively subdivided in the way that I just divided that one up, so that you have a set A and B on either side separated by some set S in the middle, then uh, we can get the MLEs for, by guessing uh, if the following three conditions hold. So one, the graphical model is decomposable, like defined. Two, the potentials are defined on, say, maximal cleats or factors. And three, the, the potentials are parameterized just as if they were tables. So there's no, so you know, if you know which uh, sort of index of the potential function you're thinking about, which factor you're thinking about, and the value of the variables for that factor, xc, then you're just looking up the value in a table, theta c xc. Okay, and step one is set each cleat potential to its empirical marginal, and then step two is divide out every non-empty intersection between cliques exactly once. So this is exactly what we did. <coughs> right, we said uh, we multiplied together P tilde AB, P tilde BC, and then we divided out once by the overlap. Down here, we were doing the same thing by multiplying together uh, the, the two sets and then dividing out by their overlap. Okay, and we could show again that the conditions for maximum likelihood estimates hold in this case. So, uh, so how is this different from learning a Bayes method? Sort of similar, but so think about a tabular Bayesian network. We're parameterizing it by some tables. These are just conditional probability tables. How did we learn those, those networks? Bayesian network, all we did 
was step one. We just computed empirical marginals, counted up the number of times each configuration occurred, and divided by uh, the number of times. So, uh, so essentially the only difference here is that we have this overlap that we needed to take into account and divide it by. Um, so, I mean, Bayes nets by definition are directed graphical models. Um, so, yeah. So, I guess, no, by definition. Okay. okay, so um, so this is if you want just tabular potentials. But I, I claim that you probably don't ever really want tabular potentials. It's nice to have this connection between the two, uh, but uh, in fact, you probably want something richer. And, and in general, uh, most of the times when we're talking about Markov random fields and conditional random fields, we're actually thinking about uh, a log linear parameterization, something that looks like this. Psi of xc is equal to x both theta dot f. Okay. And here, uh, so you know, we have some arbitrary general graph uh, conditional random field. It's the product of a bunch of potential functions times 1 over the partition function. And one way that we could actually define it uh, for a CRF uh, would be in this log linear form. Okay. And so, uh, in fact, uh, we, could, we could also do this for sort of the simpler case of a, uh, of a Markov random field. And uh, for a Markov random field, What we would have is, uh, so this is going to be a Markov random field with feature-based potentials. So we would say that uh, we're going to assume that we define each of our um, potential functions, say psi c of some xc, as x of some vector theta dot product with a feature function that is specific to, to that clique on xc. And I'm even going to put a little vector over top of that feature function to indicate that the, the value returned by fc is itself a vector, right? It's a vector of features. So it's telling us all sorts of interesting information about the actual little configuration of random variables. Okay. And so often then uh, it's further the case that uh, this breaks up so that we have, you know, this dot product uh, might be for some, uh, let's say, if we have m different features, we could have a little sum from m equals 1 up to m, um, theta m times the mth entry in this feature vector of x. So here, um, once we've actually uh, gotten the definition of the model in this way, now we can actually do sort of the standard uh, steps that we would use to find maximum likelihood estimates. So we could write down, say, the average log likelihood and that would look something like uh, L of our parameters theta given our data set D and uh, this would just be, you know, the usual 1 over n of a sum from i equals 1 to n of a log of the probability of, say, the i sample, so that would be some x i, uh, given our parameters theta. Okay. And, uh, we could then 
push our definition of the actual potential functions in uh, to get some specific log likelihood for this. And from there, we could actually come up with uh, the actual partial derivatives for this thing. So once we had partial derivatives, then we could actually uh, optimize that log likelihood using something like gradient descent. Okay, so now let's look at conditional random fields. So for conditional random fields, we're going to say that, uh, actually, in, eh, before we get there, let's, um, let's keep spelling this out just a little further. Okay. So here, um, just so that we can better paint this contrast, um, we can actually think of, <coughs> Uh, of now defining our MRF in terms of output variables y. And doing so is going to allow us to kind of more clearly see uh, the connection to, um, to what we're doing with uh, conditional random fields. So uh, what we'll say is that uh, our data for an MRF is going to consist of just these instances xi, where we have n of them. And then uh, we'll leave space here to come back and define uh, the CRF in just a minute. And then our model uh, for the MRF is going to be uh, the probability of uh, y i given theta is the product over, uh, or sorry, let's do the partition function first here. So it's going to be 1 over uh, our partition function z times a product over Tweaks uh, or factor C of psi C y C, where uh, these psi C's are defined as above. And then uh, here um, we can say that uh, this average log likelihood sheet and copy down is what we're going to work with for um, for both the MRF and CRF. So for the MRF here, uh, it's exactly what we had already written. And then the last detail, so there's going to be more space here. For the CRF. is just going to be the actual derivatives. And to get the derivatives, we'd actually have to sort of step through some calculus. But uh, for the MRF, uh, the derivative of the likelihood, L of theta, given d, with respect to one of those parameters, theta k, uh, is going to work out to have uh, this interesting form that depends on uh, uh, the actual uh, feature counts. So specifically, what we'll have is uh, 1 over n times a sum over each of the training instances. So that's i equals 1 to n, times another sum over clique c. And for each of those, we're going to add up the number of uh, features, f, here sub-indexed by, say, k, the parameter with which we're taking the derivative with respect to. 
of uh, the actual assignment to the y variables from that ith training instance. So that's the first term. The second term is going to be, again, 1 over n. This time, we have three summations, one from i equals 1 to n, one over the clique c, and one over the possible values that the clique could take on. So we'll call that y prime sub c. And so for each of these, we're going to have the probability of y prime c times, again, f c k of y c i. So what we get in the end is going to be this difference between the actual number of times that we observed the kf feature with the number of times that our model expected to observe the kf feature. Okay. So here, this is just uh, an expectation under the data distribution. So we could actually write this as an expectation where the the actual the actual value that we observe here is sampled from an empirical distribution over the data of that particular uh, feature value f k of y. And then over here, this is uh, that same expectation, but this time where the y isn't sampled from the data distribution, but where it's sampled from our model's distribution of f k of y. So essentially, uh, here we're getting the actual counts by just looking at the actual data, but here we're getting the, the actual counts by taking into account the actual marginals that we would obtain uh, by some algorithm like BP. So we need some inference algorithm to actually collect uh, these marginal probabilities. But you can actually even say sampling y from the model distribution. So if so, remember how we had these uh, these pictures of uh, you know if you had a way of sampling directly from the MRF and you know we kind of joked well you could you could throw those samples up on the slide one at a time right if if you were able to draw samples from the actual model distribution right so this would. Uh, so later on in the course, we'll actually define algorithms by which you can uh, sample from the model a particular y. But that data isn't like data stuff. That's just the current data, right? That's the actual current data. That's right. That's, the, that's not the optimal data. Right. Right. It's the current data. So, so I mean, this is this is a uh, maybe. I mean, this equation is true, and I'm just rewriting this particular term as an expectation, and the thing to observe is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the expectations, the empirical expectations from the actual data match the empirical, the, sorry, current model expectations. And if they don't match, then it means we haven't yet found the right values of the parameters. OK, so now. Let's think about uh, this. Oh, yeah. Um, I just had a quick question. So just to clarify, the first part is like uh, what the training set um, actually empirically is, and the right term is like oh. what your model is currently predicting. Yeah, there's also, sorry, there's also a 
egregious error here. Sorry, I was trying to switch us to Ys here, which will make sense as soon as we start writing out the CRF. So here, up there, the data is, is Y, does that make sense? So you were saying the context of... Um, the left term and the right term. So the left term is going to be like what you expect, what, the, what you predict for the actual <coughs> training set, and then the right is like what your model is currently predicting um, at some iteration of the training set. That's right. So, I mean, putting it another way, uh, this is what you actually observe in the data. This is just counting up uh, the actual values for these features on the data. And this is the expected value of that feature using the marginal for each of the uh, factors in your factor graph. Um, so then, um, basically, this is saying for some, like, so for some kth term in your parameter, then the left term uh, is what you compute, like, what you expect that feature to be, and the right term is like um, for each of the n examples, like, what you predict for that kth feature to be. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah, so, uh, so maybe this would have been almost cleaner. I mean, you could also imagine rewriting this entire thing by taking the 1 over n terms and these two summations over i and c and pulling them out. And then what we would have is just for each, not just example, but for each factor in each example, we would then be taking the difference of the actual feature value with an expected value, just this inner term, Right, for that particular factor. So it's like we're trying to take the actual feature value and make it match the model's expectation of that value. And when those two expectations match, uh, then at that point, this partial derivative will be zero, and so we'll have converged. So in practice, how do you actually use this derivative? OK, well, training for the MRF and the CRF. Can you move this oh, thanks. Is just going to be stochastic gradient descent or your favorite optimizer. Okay, so. Yeah. so does the second one mean the samples were all possible bias? So. Um, yeah, so if you're thinking, so whenever you define an expectation, you need to say uh, under what distribution that expectation is defined. And so here on the left, we're saying this is sort of like, like an expectation where the distribution over y's is given by whatever you have in your data set. And the expectation on the right is given by the current parameters of the model. So that's what we mean when we have an expectation of the subscript y sample from and so you can think of that as if you were to take the empirical counts from an infinitely large sample from your model, that's what this would be. And yet we have a way of, if you already know how to compute those uh, factor marginals, then we already have a way, sorry, these are factor marginals, <coughs> of uh, exactly computing that expectation. We don't actually need to do, do any sampling here. OK, so now let's think about what it would look like to make this model conditioned on some x. Okay. So we want a conditional distribution, p of y given x. And just as before, we're going to define our potential functions as a function of y alpha and x. But this time, remember that x is conditioned on, and so for every single feature function at alpha, we can have it depend fully on all of x. Okay. So uh, here's a picture of uh, our part of speech tagging case, where uh, y alpha is going to be, I guess this slide is a little misleading. This is. Uh, this is really all of y, and this is all x. And the particular assignment, say this was alpha equals 1. So we would say that uh, a particular assignment to these two variables, that would be uh, y alpha equals 1. 
right? So if, if they were noun and verb, that's one possible assignment. So that factor, alpha equals one, can look at that noun and that verb, but it can also look at all of the sentences in the sentence because uh, we're conditioning on x. Okay. So similarly, um, so this is the same typo. This is y and x. So uh, if we had some more complicated factor graph and some sort of tree, um, you could also express the whole thing in the same way. So, I mean, a particularly common case is that of linear chain CRFs. And these are closely related to hidden Markov models. So if you know a hidden Markov model, it captures the dependencies between each state, uh, which are the y's, and the corresponding observations, which are the x's. Um, but there's, there's sort of some problems with that, which is that uh, in practice, it's sort of silly to think that uh, all of the information about a particular tag, like Y2, is encapsulated in just one word, X2. So, for example, um, uh, you might have a case where the value of Y2 should actually depend on you know, a window of five words to either side of it. And the HMM doesn't have any way of capturing this. Okay, so conditional random fields, by contrast, can actually condition on that entire sentence, and they do so by defining these potential functions that actually look at the sentence. Okay, and so the uh, the actual question then is, uh, how do we define those potential functions? And so one way of doing it is to say we're going to have two kinds of factors. Uh, we're going to have these red ones, which we'll call, say, emission factors. And we'll have these blue ones that we'll call transition factors. Okay. And the transition factors are going to be pretty simple. They're only going to look at uh, a pair of variables, yk and yk minus 1. Yeah, sorry. It's also dependent on uh, this tag as well. Uh, so, yes, but the actual parameterization doesn't, like when you're, when you're actually thinking about the value of y2, all of the information that the model captures about it in the HMM is encoded in y1 and x2. So as long as you know those values, you have all the information you need. Like you don't need x1 in that case. Okay, y1 is not observed. Oh, sure, if y1 is not observed, yes, then x1 is also going to play a role. So in that case, yes, in a joint distribution sense. So, I mean, essentially what you're saying is uh, that, like, you're sort of making the point of this entire class, which is it's helpful to have a joint model over your outputs. Okay, and the HMM does capture that, but the actual model, when it's described, uh, the actual direct sort of reference for the value of y2 is coming very distinctly from a transition and admission probability that only look at y1 and x2. So that's the deficiency that I want to fix. Okay, so at first I don't want to fix that deficiency. I just want to draw a picture that looks kind of like something you, you may or may not have seen before, um, which is an HMF. So here the transition uh, features are only looking at a pair yk and yk minus 1 of adjacent uh, tag variables. And then the emission is looking at the tag variable and the corresponding word. Okay. So, so far, all we've done is we've basically got the same thing as an HMM here, except that it's globally normalized. 
So this is identical to an HMM except that it's globally normalized. But, uh, <coughs> oh, and so it's useful here to sort of stop and think, uh, what does this actually look like? Like, are there other models that we've worked with that look similar to this sort of model? Okay, so obviously the HMM shares some similarities. Are there other models up here that kind of share similarities to what we just talked about? This particular parameterization? So think for a moment about doing something completely ridiculous. Imagine that you just concatenated together all of the tag variables into a long string. Call that string your label. Okay. There's, if, they, if there were only two possible tags, then you have uh, two to the fifth different possible strings. Now, build a logistic reg regression model over the two to the fifth possible strings. If you did that, it would start to look surprisingly like this model. Specifically, if it was a multinomial logistic regression model. Okay. So, in the same way that multinomial logistic regression is just taking x both theta dot uh, some feature vector, that's what we're doing here. We've just decomposed into a product of a bunch of little x both theta dot f terms. OK, so the ridiculous part of this is that we haven't actually solved what I claim was going wrong with the HMM, which is that not only is it locally normalized, but it's also only depending on a single word. So with the CRF, um, because the vector x is observed, we can condition on it for free. And conditioning is how we converted from the MRF to the CRF. And so we can now essentially just rewrite <coughs> what we just had before and say, OK, this transition factor is going to depend on that pair of tags, but it's also going to look at all of x. OK, so suddenly now the features that you define can look at any part of the sentence. They're not just restricted to that pair of tags. Likewise. If you define an emission factor that looks at the current tag and all of x, it can have arbitrary features that look at any word in the sentence. So visually, usually once we're drawing a CRF, we do so without even showing the variable corresponding to x. Because essentially, it's just this thing we're conditioning on, and it kind of disappears into the background. And the only place that it essentially is showing up is when we're actually defining uh, you know, where our potential functions came from. Essentially, all of the potential functions can depend on x. As well, the partition function is no longer an arbitrary constant z, but rather some uh, value that ensures that for a particular x, our distribution over y's sums to 1. OK, so if we want to learn a conditional random field, then again, we would write down the objective function, we'd compute the partial derivatives of the objective, we'd feed our objective function and its derivatives into some black box that does optimization, and then we'd retrieve the optimal parameters from the black box. And, you know, what's the black box? Uh, whatever, some Newton's method, a quasi-Newton method, stochastic gradient descent, whatever your favorite optimization algorithm is, you can use it here. Okay, so here's stochastic gradient descent, for example. Okay, so now we can jump back to what we were doing with the MRF and, and show how it contrasts with a CRF. So for a CRF, we're going to have data that looks pretty similar, but now it will be pairs of uh, YIs and XIs. Again, we'll have n of them. And then for the actual model, now we have some p of yi given xi 
and theta. And that's going to be some 1 over z of x. Right, so the partition function of the function of x times a product over factor c of psi c, which can be a function of y c, but also of the entirety of x. This would be And then the average log likelihood uh, is actually going to be exactly the same, except that now uh, we actually have to condition on x as well as theta. So this is 1 over n, a sum from i equals 1 to n of the log of the probability of yi given xi and theta. And then the last detail is the actual partial derivatives. And here, uh, the partial derivatives are exactly the same, except that this term becomes fck of yci and the vector x. Right? So this can be a function of both the values of y and x. And likewise, over here, uh, this becomes uh, fck of yci and x. And lastly, this factor marginal is now defined as uh, p of yc prime, again, given So the derivative is, again, just trying to do this matching of expectations. But here, uh, everything just gets a condition on x. OK. So this idea is, uh, is a really powerful idea. And it's what's going to kind of allow us to uh, now sort of connect this back to uh, learning in a setting where uh, we're uh, coming up with our potential functions, not just based on some feature function, uh, some fixed constant feature function, but some function that depends on our parameters. Right? So the reason that I like kind of starting here, and the reason that, in some sense, much of the work on MRFs and CRFs started here is that uh, essentially um, there was uh, there was a lot of sort of math being done, or there was a lot of um, calculus being done on paper at the time. Since then, we've gotten a little bit wiser, and we realized nobody actually likes doing calculus on paper. Um, that's something that your instructors ask you to do on homework assignments. Now, everybody likes to do calculus automatically, using automatic differentiation or backpropagation, right? Uh, and so if uh, we define our potential functions uh, as, as we did up here, then the only dependence on theta is in that dot product. Okay, so when we take the log of these potential functions, it's actually a linear function of theta. This is why we call it a log linear model. Okay. So what if it's a nonlinear function of theta? Okay. Oh, uh, before we get there, let me make a quick note here. Um, so there's, there's some really interesting results when you start to look into um, this contrast of uh, conditional random fields and the sort of equivalent Bayesian network. And uh, so there's, there's this paper of mine in Jordan 2008 that actually compares uh, these, the HMM and the CRF with identical features, right? That's actually the first CRF that I proposed, where we hadn't improved on the HMM in any way. And what they did was they looked at two different settings. One was a data set that was from real data, and the other was a data set where they had synthetic data generated from the HMM. And what they found was that when 
they were working with real data, the model was actually misspecified. It wasn't actually the true place that the data had come from. Okay? I mean, if it's a real data set, it was generated by humans. This was actually Wall Street Journal data. Okay, but when the model was well specified, so when they worked with synthetic data, uh, the actual performance of the two models flipped. So when it's misspecified, the CRF does better, and when it's well specified, the generative or HMM model does better. Okay. And so uh, they they also had uh, sort of some interesting theoretical results that explain why that sort of thing could happen. But shortly, we'll be talking about uh, Bayesian networks in the context of topic modeling. And uh, they have some nice properties, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, learning, from learning in an unsupervised way. OK. So this leads us to, to think about neural potential functions. And uh, Essentially, what we're doing here is thinking about hybrids of graphical models and neural networks. And the whole idea is, is not really about like the convergence of two distinct fields. It's about sort of saying that uh, there's this sort of state-of-the-art collaboration that very naturally exists between these two complementary techniques. So the whole motivation is that Graphical models are really good at kind of letting you encode domain knowledge about the interactions of your output variables. And neural nets are really good at fitting the data discriminatively to make good predictions. And so the, the question is, could, could we define a neural net that incorporates the domain knowledge as in a graphical model? Put another way, could we actually use the graphical model uh, as essentially just uh, a loss function at the end on top of our sort of standard graphical model. So the usual recipe for training neural nets is, you know, we're given training data to choose a decision function, a loss function, and uh, we define our goal to be empirical risk minimization, and then we train with stochastic gradient descent. And so... Uh, the question now becomes, what if we defined our decision function to be a graphical model? So we actually know how to compute marginal probabilities for inference, but then we still need some way of actually sort of making predictions. Why? And one answer is to actually use a minimum base risk decoder as the decision function in this recipe. So what's a minimum base risk decoder? Well. So suppose we're given a loss function, and uh, we're asked for, well, actually, I'm going to come back to this next time, because I want to say more about that than I have time to say. OK, so instead, I want to highlight um, this sort of interaction between back propagation and belief propagation. Okay. So the next thing that we can think about is what would happen if uh, we put together, say, a Markov random field, or let's, let's talk about a conditional random field here, uh, with LSTM potentials. So in this case, uh, we're going to do kind of like before. So our, our data is going to be conditional. But our model is going to assume that uh, we take in some x. And that x is fed into some LSTM. And the LSTM is going to output some values, call them z, uh, that represent our x. Okay. And then we're going to say that those outputs of the LSTM are actually going to feed directly into the definitions of 
are potential functions, psi. And once we have our potential functions, psi, we can feed those into something like belief propagation. And out of belief propagation, we'll get marginal probabilities. Something like p of yc given x. So once we have marginal probabilities, we can then feed those into a loss function like log likelihood. And out of log likelihood will come some single number L. Right? Okay, well not just any L, it's uh, it's an L that we care a lot about, which is something like uh, L of theta, uh, given our data set D. Or, well, not really our full data set D, but really just, uh, this is sort of like the, uh, the, the loss function for one particular training example, right? So this is L of theta, given that particular input x. So, to compute a log likelihood, though, uh, we can't do it just based on those marginal probabilities. We also had to have some true value for y. Right? This is our ground truth y. And so uh, we feed both the ground truth and the marginal probabilities together to get the log likelihood. And sorry, the output of the leaf propagation, I should be a little more careful here is both marginal probabilities and also our partition function, c of x. So those two together are what, what we're using to get the log likelihood. OK, so the, the last remaining detail here is where do we actually get, um, uh, where, where, where are the actual theta parameters from? And so what we can do is we can say, well, theta are actually going to be uh, some parameters that uh, the LSTM is relying on. And so now uh, we almost have a full specification of a computation graph that would allow us to compute some loss function, L of theta, based on some input x and some parameters theta. And the question will just be, can we backpropagate through this thing to, to get uh, appropriate uh, gradients of, say, the loss with respect to z? And the, the sort of remaining detail here that I should be careful about is that whatever the outputs of z are, They might be positive, they might be negative, but our potential functions need to be uh, some uh, values which are non-negative. And so we can say that anything that comes out of the LSTM, we're going to first pass it through a hex function before feeding it into the potential. So now, this is actually going to ensure that the potentials are non-negative, which is a property that we actually need in order to uh, properly define them. If they go negative, then we don't have a proper specification of the probability distribution. OK. So, So this is uh, just a sort of a pictorial representation of the actual computation graph. And uh, the real insight here is just that uh, we're going to define 
uh, psi of uh, c of y c and x to be just x of some LSTM of x. Oops, and uh, here we can combine that with, so this can be some function of, of that and, oops, and our actual values yc. So once we've done this, now uh, the actual parameters are sort of tucked away deep inside this function. But we already know that this is going to be differentiable. That's, how, that's why we chose an LSTM to begin with. And so the question is, can we actually come up with uh, the derivatives that we need to be able to backprop? So, um, so I'll jump to the punchline without actually going through the math. And we'll go through the math next time. So if we write out our log probability, turns out if we just try to take the partial derivative of the log of our potential, right? so this will ensure that whatever these values are, the log of the potential, it can be uh, a positive or negative number. So that you could think of as those z's that came out of uh, x with an LSTM of x. So the partial derivative with respect to the log of that potential is this, has this incredibly simple form. Okay. The derivative is just an indicator function saying whether or not the true ground truth value of y alpha is equal to y prime alpha. Okay. So this is either 1 or 0, depending on whether they're equal or not, minus the probability of y prime. Okay. So essentially what we have here then is uh, another setting kind of like what we were seeing in this uh, matching of feature counts with expected feature counts. But here we're looking at uh, the number of times that y prime is equal to y alpha, which is either 0 or 1 in this particular example and its difference with the probability of y prime. And what we're trying to do is get those to match. So we're going to try to drive the probability close to 1 if they're equal, and we're going to try to drive it down to 0 if they're not equal, because that's, the val that's not the correct assignment to that particular factor. Okay. So once we have this derivative, we'll be able to backpropagate through, and we'll be able to build uh, hybrids of, say, neural nets and HMMs, where uh, we have, say, emission probabilities that are coming from neural networks, or hybrids of conditional random fields, and then LSTMs or CNNs, uh, where all of our potential functions are defined by some neural networks, which are just a function of X. Okay, so next time we'll, we'll wrap up our discussion uh, uh, looking at a couple different case studies of these sorts of hybrids uh, along the lines of what you're building for. Okay, catch you then.